is Mr. Coates, and this is uh, APES lecture number 22 on energy, the basics of energy. One of the important things to realize about this class is that energy accounts for a large portion of the exam. And so knowing about energy sources, energy types, energy conversions is pretty important. So we're going to spend some time on energy. Uh, so this is the first lecture. We're going to go into some of the basics about energy, and then we'll get to uh, some of the calculations. So there are forms of energy, and you guys learned about these uh, in previous classes. So there are two main forms, potential and kinetic. Now, um, energy, let's first talk about what is energy. Energy is the ability to perform work. So anytime that uh, you are moving about doing something, you are using energy, and the ability to use energy is the ability to perform that work. So as I said, there's two types, kinetic and potential. And kinetic is the energy of motion. So we have this train car here, and if this train car is moving down the track, then we have kinetic energy happening as the energy of motion. Now it's important to realize that there are other types of kinetic energy out there that we often forget about. For example, light energy. Light energy is kinetic because the waves are moving. If you look at light waves, they have a wave shape, shape form, and they are actually moving towards from the source towards something else. And so because that energy is moving, that is kinetic energy. Same thing goes with sound. Sound is in waves as well. And because sound moves and it creates vibration of the particles in which it's moving through, then it is also considered kinetic energy. Now potential energy is the uh, energy of position. So depending on how the uh, object is placed, it has the potential to move. So for example, if, we're, if this train track is on a hill here, then um, and the brakes are applied, and the train is not moving, it actually has a potential to move because it's on a hill. Once the brakes are released, then the train will start moving. Uh, other types of potential energy include chemical energy. And that's kind of the energy we're going to be mostly concerned with in this class is going to be chemical energy. For example, in this coal, these train cars here are full of coal. Coal has a lot of potential energy stored inside of it. And when we burn the coal, that energy is released. One other type of potential energy we're going to talk about is nuclear energy. And this is the energy within atoms. And when we break apart atoms, great amounts of energy are released. All right, so one of the major things about energy is units, units and power. So let's look at some units here. The first one we want to look at is kilowatt hour. Kilowatt hour is going to be the most uh, widely used energy unit you'll see in this class, and maybe even kilowatts. Okay, joule is another uh, energy unit. In fact, joule is the SI unit of energy. Another type of uh, energy uh, unit here is BTUs, or British Thermal Units. And uh, you will see these quite a lot in class because these are a way to measure heat. And remember, heat is a type of energy. Now, power is something totally different. Power is the rate at which energy is transferred uh, from one place to another. So that's what power is. And we usually measure that in a unit over a time period. So in this case, kilowatt hours per year, or it could be PTQs per hour. What you should be comfortable with is converting any of these energies uh, units back and forth. Now, we don't use DKT in this class. I'm not even sure what that is. Um, but you may see therms, especially when you're looking at natural gas. Natural gas contains therms. They measure natural gas in therms. So you might see that. Not that often, though. Definitely kilowatt hours and BTUs in this class, and also watts. Uh, horsepower, you're probably not going to see that much. And like I said, kilowatts are going to be very important. Remember the energy laws. We're going to review those again real quick. The, the first law of thermodynamics states that energy cannot be created or destroyed. It just changes forms. And uh, if we see if we start with one form, we can transfer to another form. So our chemical energy was like in coal here. Okay, and when we burn it, we can get electricity out of that. We can also get light when we burn it, and we also get heat. And so all this can be transferred back and forth. You see these arrows. So kinetic energy can then be used to also produce electricity through the turning of a turbine. And uh, so all this can be uh, transferred back and forth, but we do not create any energy. It's all in the same system, and we do not destroy energy. It just changes forms. The second law of thermodynamics says that no energy transfer is 100% efficient. 
So that means that some of the useful energy that's locked up in this coal, when we burn it, we don't get out the same amount of electricity because some is turned into light and some is turned into heat. So the useful energy we get out of this uh, is going to be a little bit less than what was available in the actual coal. And that's because of the second law of thermodynamics. So this gets us into the concept of net energy. Net energy is the amount of useful energy we get out of the system. And the way that we, we figure this out is that we calculate the amount of energy we start out with and we subtract out all the waste energy that we can't use like light and heat and we get out the amount of useful energy uh, that we get uh, to perform the actual work. And once again, no system is 100% efficient. We saw that with ecosystems. Remember the rule, rule of 10? It says only 10% of the energy from one level transfers to the other. Well, thankfully, in a lot of other systems, we're a little bit more efficient. So what we have here is we have uh, gasoline down here. We have 100% energy efficient over here of our gasoline. And as we burn that in our motor, we, use a, we lose a lot of it in the exhaust gas and the heat. We lose some in the coolant, so some of that heat is transferred to our antifreeze um, in, in the uh, engine. Uh, and then some of it is lost to friction due to all the parts moving in our engine. And finally, we get out a 25% efficient power on a lot of vehicles. Now, the more we can increase this efficiency, the better off we are and our cars will go farther. So this gets us to the net energy ratio. The net energy ratio is the amount of energy that we start out with uh, that we get out versus, in this case, what we put into it. So we only get one quarter of our energy in this system that I have here uh, out. So this is a one to four energy ratio. Uh, and so we start out with four units and we only get one useful unit out. Not very efficient. Now, as I said, math is going to be very important in this section. Once again, we're going to start using dimensional analysis just like we were before, and you're going to have to convert between these units. Uh, once again, uh, you want to make sure you use your units in your calculations. Use uh, the picket fence if you're comfortable with that. It's the best way to ensure that you're going to get it correct. So I have a problem here. We have uh, 10 tons of coal, and we're going to assume that each ton produces 20 million BTUs. So I want to know how many kilowatt hours are created from that burning of that 10 tons of coal. And we're going to assume 100% efficiency here. And so we're going to start off and we're going to say, okay, so what do we have here? We have uh, one ton equals 20 million BTUs. 20 times 10 to the 6 BTUs. And <clears throat> we also said that we have um, uh, the amount of BTUs. Uh, let's see up here. We have 3,412 BTUs equals one kilowatt hour. All right, so with this information, then we can make this conversion. So let's start out by saying um, we have uh, 10 tons of coal. So 10 tons of coal. And we know that each ton produces 20 million. So to, I'm going to change this to scientific notation, 10 to the 7th here, over, uh, uh, let's see, 1 ton. And then we're going to multiply that times our, uh, let's see, BTUs. So we know that uh, each ton produces uh, 20 million BTUs. So we have uh, 1 Oh, we have already got 21. This is BTUs. This is what happens when you don't use your units. You make mistakes like that. All right, so we got our BTUs. Then we need to transfer over to kilowatt hours. And so we know that there are uh, 3,412 BTUs per one kilowatt hour. And so if we look at our uh, uh, actual units here, they cancel out, so tons and tons. BTUs and BTUs, and then we end up with our kilowatt hours, which is what we really want. So if you do all the math here, what we get is, uh, let me see what I got here, it's a little over 58,617 uh, kilowatt hours. Okay. And so that's how many kilowatt hours were burned, are produced by burning 20 million tons, or 10 tons of coal. 
And so these are the kind of calculations that you're going to be asked to, to do. So uh, because of that, let's get into your problems. So your problems or your homework for these notes then are to figure out these questions. Remember, show all of your work. So how many kilowatt hours are in 1,000 BTUs? How many watts are in 25,000 kilowatts? Uh, and if you have one kilogram of natural gas, it produces 29.3 kilowatt hours. How many BTUs are produced by the burning of 100 kilograms of natural gas? So have those ready to go in class, and I will see you soon. Hope that is helpful.